You've learned about bonding, which is the attractive forces within molecules that hold the atoms of a molecule together. We are now going to talk about forces between molecules. These forces determine whether a substance is a solid, liquid, or gas, how well the substance follows the ideal gas law, and many other properties, such as the surface tension of liquids and the brittleness of solids. You may recall that electrons are held in atoms and molecules by the attractive force they feel to the positively charged nuclei, and that molecules are held together by bonds because the attraction the nuclei feel for the electrons are stronger than the repulsions that the light-charged nuclei feel for each other and the repulsions that the light-charged electrons feel for each other. These attractions and repulsions are governed by Coulomb's Law, which relates both attractive and repulsive forces to the charges and their distance apart. What we are going to find is that Coulomb's law is behind intermolecular forces as well as bonding. In a very real sense, all of chemistry is an outgrowth of Coulomb's law. If that's the case, then we need to ask ourselves what the relevant charges are when we are looking at forces between molecules. Hopefully one type is obvious, ions. Each ion is charged, and these charges will attract or repel each other according to Coulomb's law. Next up are dipoles. In a covalent bond, the electrons will not be shared equally between the two atoms if those atoms have different electronegativities. In this example, fluorine is significantly more electronegative than hydrogen, and so the bonding electrons spend more of their time around the fluorine than they do around the hydrogen. It's not a full electron transfer, so we don't label the atoms fully positive or fully negative. Instead, we label them as partially positive or negative, where the delta means some value less than 1. Alternately, we can label the polarized bond with a crossed arrow, where the cross indicates the positive end of the bond. This arrow notation is particularly useful when analyzing molecules that have multiple bonds. Here, each hydrogen-oxygen bond is polar, with the positive end at the hydrogen and the negative end at the oxygen. If we think of these individual bond dipoles as a vector, then the sum of the two vectors gives us the overall molecular dipole. And so we can think of this water molecule as having a partially negative charged oxygen end and a partially positively charged end that is between the two hydrogen atoms. To discuss how dipoles interact with other charged entities, we will abstract the dipole into an elongated shape that has a negative end and a positive end. First, we will look at how dipoles interact with ions. Naturally, there will be an attraction of each ion to the oppositely charged end of the dipole and a repulsion to the same charged end of the dipole. But the distances, the r in the denominator of Coulomb's law, is almost the same, so the attraction and repulsion nearly cancel out, and so there's very little net force to worry about. But the situation is different when the ion is close to the dipole. Notice in this case how there is an attractive force applied toward the bottom of the dipole and a repulsive force applied toward the top. This torque causes the dipole to rotate, moving the negative end away and the positive end toward the ion. As long as the molecules are not in the solid state, they will have this freedom to move. Now consider the resulting attractive and repulsive forces. The attractive force is strong because the r squared in the denominator is small. The repulsive force is weaker because the r squared in the denominator is larger. This means that as long as the dipoles can reorient themselves to maximize attractions and minimize repulsions, there will be a net attractive force between an ion and a dipole. Moreover, many dipoles can orient themselves around ions simultaneously. As we will see, this is one of the main driving mechanisms for salts dissolving in water. Now what about dipoles interacting with each other in the absence of ions? Playing around with the geometry, we can find that some arrangements maximize repulsions and others maximize attractions. Dipoles will naturally reorient themselves into arrangements where attractions dominate, and as a result, dipoles naturally attract one another. This is just like what happens spontaneously with magnets, another type of object with two poles. Attractions and repulsions spontaneously cause the objects to line up so that the attractions will dominate, and the result is that the dipoles, on average, are attracted to each other. Finally, we have induced dipoles. Imagine a neutral atom with a lot of electrons, like xenon. Xenon has 54 protons in its nucleus and 54 electrons zipping around that nucleus. 
Because these electrons move so quickly and have such poorly defined positions due to quantum mechanics, we tend to think of these electrons as forming a diffuse cloud of negative charge. Now let's imagine bringing in a positively charged ion. As described by Coulomb's law, the nucleus will be repelled and the electron cloud will be attracted. This polarizes the atom, making the region close to the ion negative and the region further from the ion positive. The presence of the ion induces a dipole in the formerly symmetric atom. And notice that the dipole is naturally arranged in a way that the attractions outweigh the repulsions. So a positive ion can create an induced dipole, as can a negative ion, or even a dipole. I'll let you think about whether the orientation of the dipole matters. In all of these cases, the resulting attractions outweigh the repulsions. And even though I developed this idea of induced dipoles using xenon as our example atom, any atoms, whether they are free or in a molecule, have electrons floating around, so these induced dipoles can be found everywhere. The more electrons an atom or a molecule has, the greater the magnitude of the possible induced dipole. Summarizing what we've learned so far, we can have ion-ion intermolecular forces, and they can be either attractive or repulsive depending on the charges involved. We can have ion-dipole intermolecular forces, which are always attractive as long as the dipoles have the freedom to reorient. We can have dipole-dipole intermolecular forces, which are also always attractive as long as the dipoles can reorient. We can have ion-induced dipole and dipole-induced dipole forces, which are always attractive. But laying the information out in a table like this suggests a question. Can we have induced dipole induced dipole forces? It might seem that the answer would be no, because without a dipole or a free charge already present, what is there to induce a dipole? It turns out that yes, we can have induced dipole induced dipole forces. To understand why, let's look a little closer at these electron clouds I talked about a moment ago. What you may notice as you look at these zipping around is that at any given instant, just due to statistical fluctuations, there may be more electrons on one side of the atom than the other. This is an instantaneous dipole. And while it is true that this fluctuating dipole averages out to zero over time, a more complete picture of what's going on will include these momentary dipoles. To simplify our picture a bit, let's look at it like this. The electron cloud is bouncing around, creating a varying dipole. Next, let's imagine a second atom or molecule that's doing exactly the same thing. Now freeze frame, and bring the atoms close together. What happens? Well, we now have dipoles near an electron cloud that can influence each other. They can induce a dipole in each other. Now let's unfreeze, and we find that the electron clouds start to fluctuate in sync with each other, like a subatomic scale choreographed dance. The induced dipoles are created by fluctuating electronic clouds, and at every instant, the induced dipoles are attractive for each other. And so, based on just Coulomb's law and a little bit of quantum mechanics, we have these six different kinds of intermolecular forces, and nearly all of them are attractive. Very simply, this is why every substance, when it's cooled down, becomes a liquid or solid, because everything is attracted to everything else. So the molecules or atoms coalesce like the magnets I showed you earlier. Induced dipole induced dipole forces, also known as London dispersion forces, are always present because everything is made up of fluctuating electron clouds. And the other types of forces might also be present if there are permanent dipoles or ions in the system you're studying. Now let's see what we can do with this information. In particular, let's look at boiling points of some related compounds. We'll start with the hydrides of the carbon group. Hydrides of these elements all have the same shape, a regular tetrahedron, and while each individual bond is at least a little bit polar because hydrogen and the central atom have different electron activities, the geometry of a regular tetrahedron is such that all of the individual bond dipole moments exactly cancel each other out. As a result, these molecules do not have a permanent dipole moment. This means we can eliminate all of the intermolecular forces that require a permanent dipole. The molecules are also not ionic, so we can eliminate any of the intermolecular forces that require an ion. That leaves only one type of force to worry about, London dispersion forces. And because the strength of these forces depends on how many electrons are present, we would predict that these forces would get stronger as we go down the periodic table. 
So now we ask ourselves, what do stronger intermolecular forces predict about boiling point? The answer is that the stronger the forces, the more energy that will be required to pull the molecules apart from one another. And so we would expect higher temperatures are needed to put the molecules into the gas phase. And that is in fact exactly what we see. As we go down the periodic table, the boiling point increases. Now let's take a look at the effect of dipole moment. Unlike elements in the carbon group, where all of the bond dipoles cancel out for geometric reasons, the bonds in the nitrogen group do not cancel out, resulting in polar molecules. This means that the molecules should have both London and dispersion forces and dipole-dipole interactions, and therefore we would predict that nitrogen group hydrides would all have boiling points higher than the corresponding carbon group hydrides. And that is indeed what we observe. Notice that lead hydride, even without dipole-dipole interactions, has a higher boiling point than phosphorus hydride. That is because the dispersion forces are so great in the lead case. You may also notice that I left carbon and nitrogen off of this plot. Let's take a look at what happens when we add back in the period two elements and a couple of the other groups. So for all four of these groups, as we move down the periods, we keep the types of intermolecular forces the same, but add in more electrons, so the London forces increase. We also see that in the carbon group, whose hydrides are nonpolar, they have the lowest boiling points of the hydrides within a given period, because they alone have no dipole-dipole interactions. So it seems that we have a pretty good understanding now of these intermolecular forces, until we look at period two. Ammonia, water, and hydrogen fluoride don't seem to follow the trends we've been discussing so far. Clearly something else is happening with these three compounds that makes their boiling points, and thus their intermolecular attractions, higher than we would otherwise expect. Looking at these molecules, and a number of others, we can spot a pattern about which molecules have anomalously high boiling points and which do not. It turns out that all of the molecules with an unusually high boiling point have this structure. Atom X is covalently bound to a hydrogen somewhere in the molecule. In an adjacent molecule, remember we're talking about intermolecular forces, Atom Y has a lone pair of electrons, and atoms X and Y are both nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. If those criteria are met, then there seems to be an extra attractive force holding adjacent molecules together, increasing the boiling point. We call this extra attractive force a hydrogen bond. Now please be careful with the terminology here. A hydrogen bond is not a covalent bond within a molecule that happens to have a hydrogen on one end. It is an intermolecular attraction between separate molecules that is mediated by a hydrogen atom that is covalently bonded to one of those two molecules. Let's look at some examples. Let's start with ammonia. Here we have a hydrogen atom that is covalently bonded to a nitrogen atom. On an adjacent ammonia molecule, we have a lone pair on a nitrogen. This lone pair can form a hydrogen bond to the hydrogen on the first molecule. We call this hydrogen atom that is part of this hydrogen bond the hydrogen bond donor, and the lone pair the hydrogen bond acceptor. One thing to note is that each ammonia molecule has three potential hydrogen bond donors, but only one potential hydrogen bond acceptor. This means that on average only one of the hydrogen bond donors for each molecule will be participating in hydrogen bond, simply because there aren't enough acceptors for more than that. Hydrogen fluoride is the opposite story. We have three potential hydrogen bond acceptors, but only one donor. So on average, only one of the hydrogen bond acceptors will participate in hydrogen bonds, because there aren't enough donors. Each water molecule, on the other hand, has two potential hydrogen bond donors and two potential hydrogen bond acceptors. This means that water will be able, on average, to have twice as many hydrogen bonds as ammonia, and twice as many as hydrogen fluoride. Did you predict that water would have the highest boiling point? If so, then you're getting the idea. Now let's take a look at ethanol. There are a lot of hydrogens here, but are all of them potential hydrogen bond donors? Notice that only one of the hydrogens is bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So only that one hydrogen atom could be a hydrogen bond donor. The hydrogens that attach to the carbons are irrelevant. There are two lone pairs on the oxygen that could act as hydrogen bond acceptors, 
So ethanol on average has the same number of hydrogen bonds per molecule as ammonia or hydrogen fluoride, but fewer than water. This means we would predict that ethanol should have a lower boiling point than water, even though ethanol is a larger molecule and thus has greater London dispersion forces. And that prediction is correct. Ethanol boils at 78 degrees C, while water boils at 100 degrees C. Now let's take a look at some molecules that do not have hydrogen bonding. NF3 and OF2 should be obvious because they don't even have hydrogens. Hydrogen disulfide should also be obvious because it contains no nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. But dimethyl ether is an interesting one. Notice that the molecular formula is identical to that of ethanol, C2H6O, but the atom connectivity is different. None of the hydrogens in dimethyl ether are covalently bonded to the oxygen. That means our template for a hydrogen bond doesn't work. The two lone pairs on the oxygen atoms could act as hydrogen bond acceptors, but there are no hydrogens that can act as hydrogen bond donors, so dimethyl ether has no hydrogen bonding. If you said lower than ethanol, you'd be right. Where ethanol boils at 78 degrees C, dimethyl ether boils at negative 24 degrees C. That's a huge difference, especially when you consider that the collection of atoms are identical between the two molecules. So those are the rules for when hydrogen bonding happens. It might be worth a little bit of time to explore what hydrogen bonding actually is, why it happens at all, and why it is limited to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So first, let's start with the hydrogen part. What is a hydrogen atom? Well, at its most basic, it's a single proton with a single electron zipping around it, held in place by columbic attraction. Now, when that hydrogen atom is covalently bound to another atom, say another hydrogen atom, the two electrons that form the bond are now zipping around both nuclei. Now let's imagine the second atom is fluorine. Fluorine has a positive 9 charge on the nucleus and has 9 electrons. Eight of those electrons are entirely on the fluorine atom, and one is participating in the covalent bond to the hydrogen, along with the single electron of hydrogen. However, remember that fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. This means that the hydrogen fluoride bond is very strongly polarized, and the bonding electrons spend most of their time closer to the fluorine than they do the hydrogen. This leaves the hydrogen atom nucleus extremely exposed, essentially a bare proton. Think about that for a moment. The next smallest common singly charged ion is lithium plus and has a radius of 90 picometers. A bare proton has a radius 100,000 times smaller. This means that any hydrogen atom nucleus that is exposed in this way is qualitatively different from anything else in chemistry. So what does it take for the hydrogen atom nucleus to be exposed like this? Two things. The atom it is bonded to has to be small to ensure that the other electrons aren't spread out too much, which means periods one or two. And the atom it is bonded to has to be significantly more electronegative than hydrogen. This leaves only carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine as the candidates. And experimentally, we find that carbon, even though it is more electronegative than hydrogen, isn't more electronegative enough to leave the hydrogen nucleus exposed, but nitrogen is. This means that for hydrogen bonding to happen, the atom the hydrogen atom is bonded to, the X in our model, has to be nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. But what about Y? Well, clearly Y needs to be an element with a lone pair of electrons in typical Lewis structures, and it generally needs to form covalent bonds rather than ionic bonds. That reduces the candidate significantly. It also seems that small size to keep the lone pair of electrons in a small region helps. And again, we are left with the same three elements, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Now, while what I've explained here gives the classical definition of the hydrogen bond, some weaker forms of hydrogen bonding have been observed with other elements. And in later courses, you may find this definition revised. For our purposes here, however, we will use this classical definition. And now we have our complete picture of intermolecular forces. With the exception of hydrogen bonding, we can think of the forces in terms of this matrix and can identify which are present simply by looking at whether ions or dipoles are present in the system. Hydrogen bonding is a special case that results from a hydrogen atom's nucleus being exposed because it is bonded to a highly electronegative atom. 
And so for a given molecule or mix of molecules, you should be able to identify which intermolecular forces are active in the system. In later videos, we will explore the impacts that these forces have on physical and chemical properties.